Well, to begin our study through Galatians, let's just read our passage for today. It's the first five verses, Galatians 1, starting in verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so this book starts by, by telling us that it's written by the Apostle Paul, and it's written to the churches in the region of Galatia. Uh, Galatia was not just a city, it was a Roman province about half the size of New York State. And within that province, there were a number of cities. And in many of those cities, Paul had brought the message of Jesus. He had established churches on his first missionary journey there. And for us to really understand this book of Galatians and kind of build on a good foundation for the months ahead, we should know the backstory. We should know what was going on in those churches. We should know the reason for writing. And so, so to get a little glimpse of that backstory, if you could turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 13. Uh, Acts tells the story of what happened when the, the apostles, the first followers of Jesus, when they went out spreading the good news of Jesus, uh, making disciples, planting churches, doing miracles. The story of Acts is that story of how the gospel spread all around their world at the time. And, and in Acts 13, it's about 48 AD, and Paul and his companion Barnabas are on a missionary journey in Galatia. So they get to Galatia, they go to a city, they find the synagogue when they get there, and then because Paul was well-educated and a Pharisee, he would be afforded the opportunity to speak there. And so in Acts 13, they're in Antioch, and as a result of what we're about to read, the largest church in Galatia ends up being formed. It ends up being a sending church that sends people all around the region from, from then on out. And Paul is in the synagogue, and he's delivering the message, and it was a long message, so we won't go through the entire thing, but we'll pick up toward the end in verse 38. Uh, Paul has announced that Jesus rose from the dead. He's announced the freedom that we can have in that, that we can have our sins forgiven. And then he says, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything which you could not be freed from by the law of Moses. So he's announced that Jesus rose from the dead. And he tells them that because of that, there's forgiveness of sins. Jesus will free you from everything that the law of Moses couldn't free you from. And people who were there, who were sincerely trying to live lives that were pleasing to God, this would have been welcome news to them. Because if they were trying, if they were trying to follow the commandments, if they were trying to follow the law of Moses, they would have been feeling that it wasn't cutting it for them. And this law that God gave, the law of Moses, it was a good thing. It was given by God. God didn't leave people wondering what he required of us, so he gave us his law. He, he gave us commands, like the Ten Commandments, to tell us what he requires, to tell us a little bit of what his holiness is like, to guide our lives, to show us how love plays out in some of our interactions with others and with him. And so the law that God gave was all good. God doesn't do bad things. And so the giving of his law was good, and striving to follow his law was a good thing. But the problem is, his law has always only been given to people who, by nature, don't have the hearts that want to obey it. And even if we do obey it, we only keep that up for a little while. We kind of make our New Year's resolutions, we rededicate ourselves to serving him at camp, and with a couple of months, within a couple of months, we've kind of fallen off that wagon, and we're not as obedient as we were before. And so, so the law that God had given wasn't doing all that it could do, and it, not because there was something wrong with the law, but because there was something wrong with us. It would be like if somebody gave you an incredible big screen TV, and they say, here, this is a gift from me to you so that you can watch Josh Allen win the Super Bowl on this TV at your house. You, you could put that TV up, but if there's no electricity at your house, you're not going to be able to watch him win the Super Bowl. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the TV, so far, there's nothing wrong with the bills. Like, everything looks like it's good. <laughs> but if there's no electricity, if there's no power, then that thing's not going to work. And so, so God commands us, and the commands are perfectly good, and it would sure be good if we obeyed those commands. But our hearts are sinful. We lack the power. We, we, we don't want to obey God on God's terms. So we took that good thing and turned it into something that it was never meant to be. We've done a lot of things with it. In some cases, we've made the law of God into a show. We started to 
feel like we were keeping a few of those commands and that looked pretty good. And so we would follow those commands so that we could look good to other people, so that we could boast over those that we feel superior to now because they're not following those same commands. We obeyed a few and, and it looked pretty good. And, and so we started to use the commands of God to hide. And we always had kind of a phony and plastic life where we were keeping up a religious image. And we use these good commands of God as tools to turn ourselves into religious hypocrites and Pharisees. In some cases, we use those commands as a way to feel good about ourselves and secure in our future because we, we convince ourselves, well, I must be doing enough now because at least I'm keeping a few of these and most people aren't. So, so God must be for me because I've been so good. Or in the worst cases, we tried to use God's commands to, to save ourselves. We thought I could prove myself to God through my obedience. Maybe I could do enough and then I could earn his love. I could secure his blessings with the good things I do. And so we tried. We, we worked real hard. We got on that religious treadmill, but it left us exhausted and joyless and insecure and afraid. And our joy was, was sapped because at times we felt we, like we were repressing everything we really wanted to do and instead trying to do these things that we know that we should do. And so the whole thing became just this exhausting religious project. I mean, I can't prove myself to people. People are fickle and judgmental. I'll never be all that people want me to be. They, they won't notice the commands I've kept. They'll just nail me for the ones I've broken. I can't ultimately prove myself to myself because I know my past. I know my secrets. I, I know that I can't take care of those. And I know that I can't prove myself to God because he knows my true resume. There's no impressing him. So God gave this perfect law, universal law. He wrote it in stone. But the problem was that he gave it to people with hearts of stone. Hearts that were hardened against it. So that we couldn't receive it. And in our rebellion, it actually made us worse. And so God, because he's gracious, made this promise. This was Ezekiel 36, 25. This is Old Testament, before Jesus was walking the earth. He said, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. And so God's law, those, those letters in stone didn't fix people with hearts of stone. And so God said, well, I've got a fix for that too. That there's coming a day where I'm not just gonna work on you with the law, but I'm going to work in you. I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm gonna take out that heart of stone and give you a soft heart. That was going to be the solution. And so people in the Old Testament days just knew there was something more coming. There's something coming where someday something from God will free us from the things that the law of Moses couldn't free us from. And so Paul goes into this synagogue 18 years after the resurrection of Jesus, and he says, that day's here. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus rose again, and if you'll repent and believe, you'll be free. So imagine how, how good this news sounded to the people who were hearing it. These people who were trying to keep the commands, trying to be religious, but failing. Think of how good the news is. Think of how good this news is for us. That we can embrace this good news of Jesus. That we don't have to exhaust ourselves trying to please God. Because Jesus pleased the Father for us. And now we work to obey because we're accepted by God, not because we're trying to be accepted by God. So we're no longer on that treadmill. We don't have to always do good works to get God to like us because our good works would never be enough. But God already so loved the world that he sent his son to die. His love is given to us freely. It's not on the basis of the works that we do. We also don't have to perform well to get other Christians to like us because the way that we love and accept one another isn't because of what we do. It's ultimately because of what Jesus did. So we can confess our sin, we can repent, we can renounce it when we fail, and there's real grounds for real forgiveness and real unity. And then once we come to believe this gospel, it doesn't make us look down on others who don't believe it. It humbles us because it says that Jesus, that we were so bad that Jesus had to come and die for our sins. But then also it assures us because he did die. He did pay for all of it. 
And that understanding of grace frees us from the burden. It frees us from having to maintain an image that we could never maintain. It frees us from having to pretend. It frees us from having to make ourselves good and acceptable before God. It frees us from everything that we couldn't be freed from by our religious observances and our attempts to keep the commands. So this is really good news. This is the message of Jesus that liberates. It it frees us. And it doesn't just free us from old school religion. It also frees us from like new school religion that we can't keep. It frees us from the demands of like the contemporary cool religion that's always given us seven practices to be effective in everything, four steps to a healthy family, five ways to stay out of debt. I mean, the advice is good. Laws are good. But because the heart underneath our inability to follow the steps needs to change, we don't get the results that we could get. I mean, sometimes we do need financial advice. And it's good because law is good. Good law is good. But sometimes the reason that we load up on credit card debt isn't because we're in a financial crisis and it isn't even because we didn't know better. It's because we expected that purchase to satisfy. We thought there's that thing out there that if I have that, that'll be enough. Sometimes the reason that I'm not what I should be at home is because I just need some guidance, I just need some advice, I need some direction. But more often, it's because my heart gets hard and won't be humble and won't do what I know that I should do. We need the advice, we need the direction, we need it for sure. But our biggest problem is that we don't want to follow the good things that we know that we're supposed to do because of a deeper problem. We lack the heart, we lack the motivation. And and once the heart and the motivation are in place, the steps come pretty easily. Those aren't the heavy demands. This time of year, I am motivated to watch the Bills games and and nobody needs to make me do that at all. I have a a heart to watch them. It's it's going to be a priority for me. And, And there are certain steps that I have to take to watch them for sure. I have to know when kickoff is and I'm Scatterbrain, so that goes in the Google Calendar. I I have to remember when that's supposed to be. Uh, We don't have cable, and so I have to get out the antenna when there's a Bills game coming on. This is like the only thing we watch network TV for is is Bills games. And so like this last week, one of the kids said to me, are you gonna get out that router thing for the TV? I was like, no, I'm getting an antenna out. We're gonna watch TV like the apostles did. This is how it was meant to be done. We're doing this. So I have to set all that up. There have to be appropriate snacks. There are steps that I have to follow. But because I delight in the game, the steps come pretty easily. Once the delight is there, I'll follow the steps. And honestly, usually the first eight weeks of the season, I'm delighting in it. I'm wanting to watch those games. Later on, who knows? Like then it can go downhill and you may have to do other things to motivate me, but the motivation is there so the steps follow. What we so often do in the religious setting is we assume that what we need the most is the steps. Whereas the message of the gospel actually gets at the heart. And so Paul goes into the synagogue where the religious people are are trying, they're trying to obey, and he liberates them by telling them about the resurrection of Jesus. And there's no greater news than the gospel. And this is the message all throughout the Bible that this is the best news there is. This is the, the message that the church first and foremost should be giving itself to spreading. In Titus 3, verse 3, he says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is great news. All that we once were was washed by Jesus. And now as a result of that, we are heirs, we are God's kids, we don't have to do anything to get it, we just receive that grace and mercy by faith. And so we don't earn our forgiveness to connect ourselves to God from the beginning to the end. We are right with God because of what Jesus did for us on that cross. It's not by following rules that we get God to accept us. It's the grace and mercy of Jesus. Maybe today you're here and you're not a Christian and the reason is because you thought that to become one you had to keep the moral laws first. 
or that you had to take part in a ceremony first, you had to follow some outward observance, you had to do some things to make yourselves a Christian. But we are not forgiven because we keep codes and laws and follow ceremonies. We're forgiven because we realize that we broke those laws and we turn to the only place we could turn, Jesus Christ, who, who though he was perfect, died the death that we should have died by going to that cross, was buried and then rose again, conquering death, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so Paul goes into the synagogue and he announces that great news, that, that yes, Moses' gift was good. What a massive gift from God that he would guide our lives like that. But Jesus frees you. He goes on, verse 40, he says, Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. So there's this amazing response. People start believing, and they want to hear more. This is what the good news of Jesus does in people who really believe it. It, it makes us want to hear it more. It's like when you discover a great new restaurant, and you go in and you say, this is so good. We need to eat here again, and we need to tell our friends about this place too. Our whole lives, we carry guilt and fear of what God will do because of our failure, but then we hear that Jesus was crucified for our sins and rose again, and that gives us freedom and a hope and a future. Man, if we believe that, then you can tell that same story to us again and again. And keep telling it keep serving that same dish, and I want to bring my friends to hear that same thing. Serve it again next week. The friends will be here. And so the good news spreads. Verse 44, it says, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. So everybody showed up, and it wasn't because the church had some amazing programs or had a perfect sound system or perfect lighting, or it wasn't even because they were giving them a bunch of really good advice for life or motivational speeches it was because the good news of Jesus was such good news. So they gathered around, standing room only, to hear more. And people are coming to believe left and right. But that's not the only response. Verse 45, it says, So when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I've made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. So God had appointed some people to eternal life, and, and Paul and Barnabas went, and they spoke the word of the Lord, and those who had been appointed to eternal life believed in those words, and they were saved. And it says, and the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So these people are coming to faith in Jesus and they're filled with joy, they're rejoicing, but then there are some who are jealous. They're jealous of the influence that these Christians seem to be gaining, and they're also convinced that they could either be saved by keeping the law alone, or at the very least that they had to add their own efforts to the efforts of Jesus to make themselves true Christians. And so these people start opposing Paul and Barnabas and those who believe. And this same conflict happened all around Galatia, where you have the word of God being taught, people responding favorably to the word, and then others who thought that even if Jesus is legitimate, surely you must need Jesus plus obedience to the Jewish ceremonial laws to be truly saved. And specifically, they said in Acts 15:1, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. So Paul and Barnabas preached this message of free grace, believe and be saved, and others said the belief is nice, being washed is nice, but not unless you follow all the ceremonies can you be truly saved and truly united with God. And the people who said that you needed Jesus plus your own efforts were known as the Judaizers. 
Phil Reichen defines them as people who, who wanted people to become Jewish before becoming Christian. The people who thought that people are saved by the gospel plus the law of Moses. In Acts 13, they're, they're outside the church persecuting it. But by the time Galatians is written, a couple years later, they've now gotten inside the church and they're influencing it. This is the way things always go. There's always pressure from the outside on the church, but then there's also pressure on the inside from those who would bring a false gospel. And this is why Paul wrote this book of Galatians, to free us from those false beliefs coming on to the inside. And so next week we'll look at verse six, where Paul says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there's another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. In Galatians 3.1, he says, Oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It's like you're falling under somebody's spell. Galatians 4.8, he says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world? whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years, and I'm afraid that I, have ma- I may have labored over you in vain. Then in Galatians 5.1, he says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So you can hear in all these verses Paul's concern that the hard work that he did in leading these people to faith and freedom in the gospel of Jesus was being undone left and right. He had sacrificed so much, he endured so much hardship to free these people and build a church community that embraced grace grace and was centered on grace. And it was now being torn down by false Christians who were coming in, bringing the people back into the same slavery that they were in before. So the grace and the peace that, that he wishes them here are being undermined by a system of law and condemnation. This is the worst. I mean, they, they started out so well. They were really free, but now they're being led astray by the Judaizers and they're going right back to that same old treadmill. The church that was being opposed by the Pharisees from the outside is now being turned into a gathering of Pharisees who want to add human effort to God's grace. The very thing that gave them freedom and gave them joy was being stolen away by false beliefs. They were running back into a Christian-looking version of the thing that had them on the treadmill before. This is so important for us to see that they were prone to this because we're prone to this too. We're all prone to like a spiritual Stockholm syndrome where we go back into the captivity of powerless religion. And often we do so persuaded by the righteous seeming teachers who tell us that we must have to do more to get God's grace. There must be something that we've got to add to what Jesus has done to secure our place with God and one another. We, we must at least have to go part way to saving ourselves. And so Paul wants to make sure that these people know that, that that's a trap. Don't go back. And these people here are opposing Paul, and, and they're trying to oppose the gospel in two different ways. One is by trying to undermine the authority of Paul, and then another is by trying to undermine the message of the gospel itself. And so Paul doesn't waste any time here. Right away, at the very beginning of this book, he reasserts his authority. Again, he says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. So Paul says, I am an apostle. And the Greek word apostolos means sent one. And people who had the gift of apostleship were sent by Jesus. And I believe that the biblical evidence points to the fact that there are actually not any more apostles today, at least not in the same sense that there were in New Testament days. Because the apostles were the guys who got things started. They were the ones who spread and wrote the inspired word of God. And there are some passages that tell us that to be an apostle, you had to actually see Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 9.1, Paul says, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? So to be an apostle, you had to see Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, the apostles are trying to figure out who's going to replace Judas now that he's died. And it says in verse 21, So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us 
beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So someone who, who had seen the Lord. And so however many apostles there were, the last of them died off with that first generation of Christians because they were the last people to be eyewitnesses to Jesus in the flesh. And in that first generation of Christians, the apostles had a unique role. They, they traveled the world, they did miracles, and they taught. And the writings that they produced are the writings that we have in the New Testament, which are the, the word of God. And so apostles were a one-time group of people with authority to write the inspired word of God, which doesn't exist today. And so why does that matter? A few reasons. One is that there is an authority in the apostles that Christian leaders and teachers and pastors do not have today. Pastors aren't apostles. We don't have authority over the writings of the apostles, but we submit to them. So the apostles were, were a different kind of thing. We don't have the authority to change the word of God. We don't have the authority to write things down and say, there, that's the word of God. Um, we can teach the word of God that was given to us by the apostles. It also matters because the apostles had God given authority. And there are many today who would say, well, I like Jesus, but I don't like the things that the apostles had to say. So, so Jesus preached this really pure, true religion, and then people like the Apostle Paul came in and, and messed up the whole thing. You had the really pure teaching of Jesus, and the New Testament contains that pure teaching of Jesus, but then also it contains a lot of baggage that messed up the true faith. And some people who might call themselves red-letter Christians would take the teachings of Jesus as authoritative and more important than the other writings and the other teachings in the Bible. They call themselves that because some versions of the Bible were printed with the words of Jesus in red, which was not the inspired way to do it. It was just a, a decision that a printer made, but it could give the impression that those words are more important. Those words are more inspired. And so some would say, yeah, I, I love the teachings of Jesus, but I just don't like the teachings of the apostles at all. But here's the thing. Everything we know about Jesus, we learn from the apostles. Everything. Everything. We don't have the writings of Jesus in the New Testament. We, the only direct writing of Jesus we see happening in the New Testament is when he's writing in the dirt. And that manuscript is gone. We don't, we don't have that anymore. So, so we don't have his direct writings. Everything we know about Jesus was given to us by the apostles. The gospel accounts were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who were either apostles or associates of the apostles who got their material from them. The whole New Testament is the teaching of the apostles, including all the stuff about Jesus. And so it doesn't make sense to pick and choose and to say, well, I like the teachings of Jesus, but not the apostles, because Jesus commissioned the apostles specifically to carry his word. And everything we know about the teachings and the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus, we only know from the apostles. Also, there's no indication that the early church rejected the teaching of the apostles because, because they were trying instead to cling to the pure teaching of Jesus. That dynamic didn't exist at all. And, and you might expect it. I mean, Paul's story was that he was a Pharisee. He was opposed to Christianity. He was having Christians killed. He was trying to wipe out their faith. He didn't want people to believe what they believed. And then when Paul came to believe, the Christians were all surprised. But they weren't surprised because Paul came in and started preaching a different thing. They were surprised because Paul came in and preached the same thing that they had already learned. In Galatians 1.23, it says they, were o they only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. So they didn't say, we have this pure faith where we believe in Jesus. And then this guy, Paul, came in and he started twisting it. He started talking about the church. He started adding all these other things. No, they said, this is amazing because this guy, Paul, came in and he's teaching us the same thing that we've always believed. He's teaching us the Christian faith. It's amazing that that guy believes this Christian faith that he once tried to destroy, that, that he rejected it before. So it's important to realize that the apostles do have the authority to convey to us the will and the words of Jesus. Also, it's super important because this is a distinction between Protestant and Roman Catholic theology. And with respect to my many friends and many, many family members who are Roman Catholic, one of the big differences is, is that within Roman Catholicism, there's the idea that the church gave us the Bible and therefore can offer us the true interpretation of the Bible that it gave us. 
But Paul here says he didn't get his authority from man. He didn't get it from the church, but from God. And so it's more accurate to say that the Bible gave us the church. That God speaks and his people are created. And yeah, the church affirmed the Bible. Paul said right there, I'm writing this alongside all these brothers who are with me. But it was the inspired message of scripture that gave rise to the faith and that gave rise to the church. It wasn't the church that gave rise to the inspired message of scripture. And so when we want true authority, when we want the true faith, we go to the teachings of the apostles, which we have in the Bible. The authority of the apostles lies in the text of the scriptures, not in the institution of this church or any other church, and not in human teachers today, ultimately. This is why the church can regularly be corrected by the teaching of the apostles that we have in scripture. So Paul's going to spend some serious time in this book defending his authority. And, and you might look at that and think, man, that's so self-serving. Like he's just doing this because he wants to be a big deal. But you can't read the rest of Paul's story and think that. He had to suffer tremendously to spread this message. He lost his community. He lost his standing. He lost respect. He was often beaten. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. He was mocked. He was considered the scum of the earth. There was constant drama in his life because of the ministry that he was doing. He was always having to fight false teachers. He said in one place that he had constant concern for all the churches. So he was losing sleep over all of their needs, keeping him up at night. Paul didn't do this for Paul. He did this because of what Jesus can do for those of us who will believe in him. Again, verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever, amen. Jesus rescues us from the present evil age. He does this internally and externally. He, he rescues us from sin. We spend our lives looking for something that can satisfy and so we will lie, we will steal, we'll destroy relationships to give ourselves to the task of attaining whatever that idol is. And then if we ever get that idol, once we get it, it doesn't satisfy. And if there's anything left of us after we've gotten it, it destroys that too. And Jesus rescues us from that whole quest. He's the one that can satisfy. He's the one that a thousand years from now, if you trust in him today, you won't say, I have regrets. He also rescues us from legalistic religion. Sometimes we, we live that life of sin and we think the alternative is to jump on the religious treadmill and wear ourselves out trying to get God to accept us and people to accept us. But the gospel rescues us from that as well. And it's not just our personal evil that he rescues us from, but he says the evil age that we live in. And this is not just our evil age. Every Christian has lived in an evil age. Every age has had ideologies and philosophies that are evil at their core. But like these Galatian Christians, we, we're tempted to want to appease those who hold to them. Sometimes we want to make peace with the system of the present evil age. We want to find some kind of middle ground between the Christian way of looking at the world and the way that our age looks at the world. We want to find some way for Christianity to not look so foolish in our modern age. Paul says that Jesus came to rescue us from the evil age, not to give us some way to make the age happy. Christians have a way of believing and living that doesn't fit with legalistic religion, that doesn't fit with anything goes living, that doesn't fit with what everybody thinks on Twitter we, we should be doing. Jesus rescues us from all that. He rescues us from sin and rescues us from the values and the demands of our age. And our goal is not to blend in. But over time and under pressure, we're tempted to go back like the Galatians. And what we need is what Paul provides in this book. Reminder after reminder of the gospel of Jesus. We need to keep eating that same meal again and again and again. 